And so Psalm chapter 12 tonight, I'm actually going to be taking a break, I think, after this week and start a new book next week and uh, maybe come back to Psalms at a later date. But uh, we're going to just take a break for a little bit. But uh, you probably noticed in Psalm chapter 12 tonight, if you've been following along with the um, as we preach through the book, that there are several verses there that you might have heard recently. I know uh, verses one and two, you know, I recently talked about in my sermon, uh, Rare Breeds, uh, The Faithful Man. We kind of talked about that. So I don't want to re-preach a lot of the same things that I've already kind of gone through. Um, even some of the other verses there I, I referenced in another uh, chapter when we were going through Psalms earlier. But um, I, I don't want to repeat myself there. But the fo- the, what I want to focus in on is there in verse 6 where it says, The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth. So I'm going to get to that point, and I want to kind of focus in on those verses. But let's just jump in at verse 3 where it says, uh, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue will we prevail, our, own, our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. So, Again, I don't want to repreach all this, but he got a, this kind of the context of the chapter here is that God gives us certain guarantees or promises. And you can see that there in verse 3, that the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and those that speaketh proud things. And he says in verse 5 that, Now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety. He's going to arise for what? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now these are, these are promises in the word of God. These are assurances. These are guarantees that we have. And you know, we have to take, the difficult thing here is that we have to take God at his word while bad things are taking place. This, isn't, this is something that God is going to do, right? God is going to arise for the oppression of the poor, meaning that the poor are going to go ahead and have to be oppressed and wait for God to arise. And that God is going to cut off all flattering lips and them that speaketh, and the tongue that speaketh proud things, meaning that the, there are going to be flattering lips. There are going to be people that speak proud things that are going to have this attitude So these are guarantees, these are promises in the Word of God, but we as God's people have to accept them by faith, and and we have to understand that these are things that we wait on, that these are things that we wait for God to move and for God to do these things. In the meantime, we have to endure the flattering lips, you know, that the fact that the proud must first speak, and then God is going to, uh, you know, cut them off, that the poor are going to be oppressed, and then uh, uh, God is going to arise. The needy must first sigh before God is going to deliver them. So while we, uh, you know, take these things at face value, why we believe these promises that are here by faith, um, we might end up feeling like David. You know, I talked about this a little bit again last week when we were going through Psalms, but if you look in chapter 13, verse 1, he says, How long uh, wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? So we wouldn't say that David, you know, is a disbeliever. David obviously was a, was a, a saved man, a faithful man. He was somebody who was used mightily of God. But even David, as spiritual as he was, at times felt, you know, that God was distant, that God had forgotten him, you know, even maybe forever, or that he has hidden his face from him. And David's just going through that same thing that we all have to go through, that we have to endure the wicked, that we have to put up with the wicked in the meantime. We have these promises that God's going to cut them off. We know that the Lord is going to come back one day. But in the meantime, you know, per, you know, it's going to be perilous times that we have to go through. And, and, and that uh, evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. And we, we understand that. And, you know, we, we can't, we, we don't want to justify it and say it's right to feel like David. But, you know, the Bible has a great way. One of the great things about the Bible is that it's relatable. You know, the characters, these are real characters going through a real human experience. And in Psalms chapter 13, he says, how long without forget me? So, you know, it's like David is doubting. And, and doubt, though it's not right, is a part of human nature. It's something that we all experience to some degree or another. I mean, even the greatest man that was born among women, John the Baptist, doubted. You know, he, he baptized Christ and then a short time later saying, Art thou he or should we look for another? You know, and when did he doubt? When things were going bad, when he was in prison, you know, when he was suffering for the, for the cause of Christ. So when bad things are taking place, when the flattering lips are uttering and running their mouths, and when we see the, the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy, you know, the, word, the promises of the word of God, it might be a little bit harder to believe them. But we know that they're there, and we know that they're true. 
And, and that's when we get to, you know, verses like verse 6. You know, we have this doubt, but we have to understand that verses 6 and 7, because they, they kind of seem out of place. You know, you think it's, it's like the Bible's making this hard shift where he's talking about how God's going to arise, how God is going to avenge, so on and so forth, and then, and then the words of the Lord are pure words. And, you know, it might seem like it's a hard shift, but the context is, is that, yes, doubt is a part of our nature. Yes, we go through hard things. Yes, we see the wicked, and we have the promises of God, but verse, and verses 6 and 7 are kind of assurances of that. David's kind of reminding himself, hey, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Look, I know God's going to rise. I know that he's going to, uh, you know, cut off all flattering lips. I know he's going to do that. How do I know that? Because the words of the Lord are pure words. They, he, he shall keep them from this generation forever. So we see tonight, we really want to focus in on, you know, that's kind of the context of Psalms chapter 12, I believe, is that just, you know, w we go through times of doubt. We have times where we have to we have the promises of the word of God, but we might doubt, you know, we might understand, we have to wait on those things. In the meantime, we are sure ourselves by faith that the Bible is the word of God, that we have these promises. And it says there in verse 6 that the words of the Lord are pure words. And again, keep something in Psalms tonight, we'll be back, but go over to Proverbs chapter 30. And keep something in Proverbs 30, because we're going to come back kind of at the end there. And I'm going to have you turn several places, you might want to throw a bulletin or whatever in there, keep a thumb in there if you're able, because we are going to come back at the very end. But, I, I, you know, Proverbs chapter 30 is a real special verse to me. It's one of the very first verses I ever memorized. It's one that I've come back to over and over again uh, early on in my Christian life. And, you know, it's verses like this, I think, uh, that are important to a new believer and to, the old, you know, to those of us that are more seasoned in the Lord as well, those that have grown in the Lord more. We even also have to be reminded that the Word of God is just that, the Word of God. Now, that should probably, you know, any kind of doubt or any times that we might have about that, those instances should probably grow further and further apart as we grow in the Lord. But, you know, it's, it's natural sometimes to just kind of question, well, is God going to arise? Is he going to cut off all flattering? I mean, is this really going to happen? And we have to understand the assurances that we have God's promises. We ha and we can, we can trust and rest on them. We are assured by them because of the fact that the words of the Lord are pure words. And that's repeated again in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. It says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So again, every word of God is pure. So you say, well, how do we know that? How do we know that we have the pure word of God? How do we know that you know, this hasn't been corrupted, it hasn't been tainted in some way? And that's a criticism that you hear a lot. We hear people say that all the time. Well, you know, the Bible was just written by men. You know, and they put their own slant on it. And they, they have put their own bias into the word of God. We can't trust it because how do we know it's really pure? How do we, yeah, there's probably some truth in there, but, you know, it's been corrupted over the years and things like that. Well, at the end of the day, and really the crux of the whole message tonight is that you have to just accept these things by faith. Okay. But the promise is, is that every word of God is pure. We have that assurance from the Lord that, God has preserved us a perfect word of God in the King James Bible for the English-speaking people. And the purity of God, and you say, well, why is that? How can you, I can't, and there's nothing I could say to prove that, but we can look to Scripture and we can use logic, what we know about God, and so on and so forth, and, and draw some conclusions, you know. One conclusion would be that, you know, we know the word of God is pure because of the fact that the word of God is a reflection of himself. You know, every author puts themselves into, the, into what they write if you know what I mean. Like, it's always a reflection of, it's coming from there, from, the, from within them, right? Now, we know God didn't, you know, come down here and, and literally write the book that he used holy men of old and that he inspired others to write, that were, that, that were moved under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to write the things that are written, but ultimately, God is the author. That is the claim of Scripture. That's what we believe. And therefore, because God is the author, we could trust the fact that God's book, his, his word, is pure because God himself is pure. And if you would, go over to Job chapter 14. Again, keep something in Proverbs 30. But the Bible says in Psalm, Psalms 119, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. And I love that phrase, therefore thy servant loveth it. Now, of course, again, this is just a, a verse to reassure us that God's word is, is not only pure, but it's very pure. And this is something David understood, you know, that God's word is pure. That we don't have to question whether or not 
it's been tainted in some way or whether or not it's, it's mixed with lies or something like that. No, the, God's word is pure. And it says, therefore, thy servant loveth it. You know, and this is kind of a separate point, but, you know, since we're on the subject, you know, we're kind of <laughs> return to the verse, but he says, thy servant loveth it. Now, who loves it? His servant. You say, well, I don't know that I love God or God's word as much as I should. Well, maybe you just need to serve God more. You know, the more we serve God, the more we live for the Lord, the more we come to appreciate his word and how pure it really is. The longer we're, we're, we're serving and living for God, the more pure it becomes. We can understand it more. And, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your love for the word of God is waning, it might be because your service is waning. I think that there's, you know, those things are interrelated. You know, thy servant loveth it. He, it's the servant that loves God's word. That's kind of a separate point. But the main point I'm trying to make right now is that how do we know that every word of God is pure? How can we say, like David, that his word is very pure? Because God is the author. And because God himself is pure, he cannot produce something that is impure. Think about it. If God is pure and God is perfect, it's impossible for him to make anything other than perfection, anything other than something pure. The Bible says in James 1, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There's no variableness in God. There's no shadow of turning in him. Every gift that he gives from above is perfect. It's complete. The Bible says, 1 John 1, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God is light. You know, God has no variableness. God is perfect, perfect, and we know that God is pure. There's no sin in him. There's no, he can't, God, which cannot lie, promised us eternal life. You know, God, can't, it's impossible. It's not even his nature. You know, it, it, the devil is the father of lies. God didn't even make, that's something he didn't even make. And so we know God's word is pure because God is the author and God himself is pure. The Bible says in Job 14, and I have you go there in verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean no not one Look, you can't bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing you can't and, and therefore we know God is clean right so anything he produces is going to be clean God is pure anything he produces is going to be pure how do we know that the word of God is pure tonight because its author the Lord himself is pure <laughs> we know God's word is pure because of the fact that he is pure and if you want to go back to uh Actually, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. You say, well, how, what do you mean God, God's the author? How did he, what, what are you talking about? I want to believe that the word of God is pure tonight, and you're telling me that it's pure because God wrote the Bible. But we know that the Bible has a multitude of, of human authors involved. Well, God's word is pure even though it was given to us through the vessels of men. You know, that's how God gave us his word. It's not like God's word just fell out of the sky one day. You know, that just, it just plopped in our laps and bam, there it was. You know, God used human instruments throughout time, throughout existence to bring his word to us. It says it's as a silver tried in a furnace of earth. You know, that's back in Psalms where he said, thy, thy words are, are the Lord's, excuse me, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth. So it's right there in that analogy that he's using. You know, the words of the Lord are pure, but they're also as silver that is tried in a furnace of earth. And he's using that refining process. And when we think about that process, you know, there's other, there's other instruments that are used, aren't there, when you refine silver. You don't just take a block of silver and just throw it into an oven and then wait for everything to burn out and then and cool off and take it back out. You know, they, they put it into, you know, a crucible. They put into these other... Uh, you know, uh, elements that can withstand high temperatures. They use tongs, there's billows, there's all these other instruments that go into that refining process, aren't there? And I don't think it's any coincidence that that's the analogy he's using, that God's word is pure as, a, uh, as silver that is tried in a furnace of earth. Because God's word has come to us through other instruments, hasn't it? God has used certain instruments to refine his word and to bring it to us just as, you know, uh, somebody would refine silver in a foundry or in, 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 that, in that setting. And you see there in 2 Peter chapter 1, what are the instruments that God has used to refine his word? It says in verse 20, knowing this, that the prof no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. 
say, well, you know, I thought, I thought it was men that wrote the Bible. It's true, but it wasn't like they just sat down and, and dreamed it up. But they just decided, well, what do we, well I'm just going to make up whatever I want. It was not the will of man. <clears throat> and says, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They were men that loved the Lord, that were filled with the Spirit, that the Spirit of God came upon. They spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this is, of course, the inspiration of Scripture. That's how we believe we receive the Word of God, is through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That He moved upon holy men of old, and they wrote or spoke, and others recorded what was said, and that's how we re received it. And so again, the author is the Lord, ultimately. And He is pure. And He has used human instruments to deliver His Word to us, therefore we can trust that it is pure. And not only that, but through using that human element, that, that, the, 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 the human instruments to deliver His Word, even within that, there is a refining process <coughs> to deliver us the Word of God. Now, God's pure Word has always existed. Okay, and we, we, we believe that. God, we've always had God's Word uh, when, it, when it's being written down, you know, in Hebrew and so on and so forth. And later, New Testament came as written in Greek, right? So we've always had these, these texts that have been the pure word of God. And then through a process, you know, we received the King James Bible. Because, you know, we're King James only. And we believe that the King James Bible is, is, is preserved and that it is, it, it is the perfect word of God given to us, you know, uh, through human instruments, given to us through, uh, you know, the, the, the translators. You know, not that the translators themselves were re-inspired, right, but that they were, they were, deriving uh, the meaning from an inspired text they were and they were faithful to the original texts in their translations <laughs> so the the words of the lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times okay and our king james bible you know came to us through a type of refining process when you think about it for example you know, it started out with, uh, you know, you had several English translations that led up to the King James Bible. You had, uh, in fact, when King James sat down and commissioned the writing of the King James Bible, and he, and he commissioned those, those, uh, the, 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 those men to, to, to do that, there were certain rules that he gave them. And he said, you can refer to these other Bibles as, as, to, as a help, but ultimately it had to come from the Greek and Hebrew, okay? That's what they had to translate from to get us the King James Bible. They were allowed, however you know, to, to use other translations that had come before the King James Bible, other English translations. You know, the Bishop's Bible was a major one. That was one that, that they were allowed to use. So you had the Bishop's Bible. You had Bibles like the Tyndale Bible, the Coverdale Bible, Matthew's Bible, the Great Bible, and the Geneva Bible. Right, so that, there, you know, there's six Bibles that God allowed us to use, that allowed them to use. And I know there's other translations that were, that were around, so on and so forth. But these were six translations that the King James allowed these men to use, right? To get to what? To the seventh one, which would be the King James Bible. So again, you know, and, and, and it's kind of interesting there that it's purified how many times? Seven times. And we had these other, you know, the King James being the seventh. So it's just kind of interesting. You know, you could say, well, that's coincidence, maybe. You know, but I think it's interesting that it's the, the King James Version is the result of six other versions that were slowly refined over the years to give us a perfect word of God. You say you didn't have the perfect word of God before that? No, they, they did in the Greek and the Hebrew, which they still have, by the way. You know? And uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that tonight, but uh, you know, that is something that, that's, that's worth noting. You know? So how, you say, how do you know that we have a poor, pure word of God tonight? is because of the fact that God is the author of it, and he has given it to us through human instruments, and in that process has refined it over the years to deliver us a perfect, pure word of God. You know, and I was, I was thinking about this. Go over to uh, Exodus chapter 34, Exodus chapter 34. I was thinking about how Moses is kind of a picture of how God gives us his word. You know, Moses was an instrument that God used to deliver his word on the children of Israel. And that's kind of a picture of how God has given his word to mankind in, in, as a whole. And if you remember in Exodus chapter 31, I'll read to you. It says in verse 18, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. 
So if you remember the story, the first time Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, you know, it says that when, when he had made an end of communing with him, that he gave unto Moses these two tablets. He gave the, the meaning this, I believe what's going on here is that God actually had these tablets pre already made, that they were handed over to Moses. And of course, you know, he comes down, we know the story, he finds the people worshiping the golden calf and Aaron. Uh, you know, and, and, the, and he ends up throwing, you know, people make that dumb joke, right? Moses was the worst sinner because he broke all Ten Commandments at once, or he threw all Ten Commandments and break those tablets, right? And then, but notice here in Exodus 34, it says in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. So now he's going back up to get these tables of stone. He's going to try it again. But now he's having Moses hew the, 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 the stone out himself. Now, instead of God just giving him the tablets, he's saying, you know what? You broke them. You got to go cut out the tablets yourself now. And I will write upon the tables the words that, are, that were in the first tablets, which thou breakest. And we know the story, verse 4, and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded and took in his hand the two tables of stone. So the first instance, God just says, here's the tables. They're already written on. Go ahead and take them down. The second time when he goes back up, he says, you hew them out this time and bring them up, and then I'll write on them. And what I think we're kind of seeing here, it, does, you know, it doesn't really matter how the word of God came to us, is that it has to be, be believed by faith. You know, the people see Moses come back down. Hey, you didn't go up with those two tablets. And you come down with these two tablets of stone. You know, God must have, you know, well, God gave them to me. Did that matter to them? Nope. They, they were just as rebellious anyway. Does it matter? Would it matter if God, if people say, oh, I believe the Bible, but you know it's written by a man. Those same people, it wouldn't matter if God, you know, lit, like a giant hand came out of heaven and just put a Bible in their hand and said, this is what I, you now will you believe it? They still wouldn't believe it. And I think that's kind of a picture of what we see with Moses, is that even if it was just, you know, given directly by the hand of God, just completely laid out in front of people, people still wouldn't believe it. And it wouldn't require any faith either. You know, it'd be, it'd be pretty easy to believe that, wouldn't it? So Moses going up the second time and taking the tablets with him is showing us that, you know, man plays a part in God delivering his word to us, that man has work to do in order to get the word of God to people, right? And Moses literally had to hew out tables of stone and go up there, you know, and, and then we had to have, you know, that whole process, all those scholars and, and a king and, you know, commission the writing and, and all of that that went into the, the buildup into the King James Bible. You know, that was kind of a hewing of stone if you want to take it that way. There was work that was to be done. So people say, oh, it was written by men. Oh, they, you know, those, those people, they, when they started translating English, they got it all wrong. They started messing with it. Those same people, it, w it wouldn't matter if God, you know, put, a, put the, the, an English version in their hands himself. They'd still doubt it. Because, and here's, here's the point I'm trying to make is that no matter how you, we receive the word of God, no matter how it came to us, whether it was through human instrumentation or just completely 100% just divinely given by some miracle, right? It doesn't matter. It still has to be believed by faith. It still has to be believed by faith. Go over to Hebrews chapter uh, 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, I'm going to begin reading a verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, you know, faith, you know, what, what's your evidence for the Bible tonight? My faith. That's it. That's all I have to, you know, I just believe it by faith. And that's the substance of things hoped for. That is the evidence of things not seen. Well, how do you know the Bible is the word of God? Because you know, millions, yea, even billions of people have believed it to be the Word of God throughout all of history. Mankind has embraced it as the Word of God, has, have died believing it's the Word of God, have died for the Word of God. It is the evidence. The, the faith that people have put in the Word of God to be the Word of God is the evidence that it is the Word of God. Amen. People don't just, you know, you know, just what are going to put all their faith in, in, into just some, some book they don't believe is the, is, isn't the Word of God. And there's just been, you know, it's the most popular book on planet Earth. And it's been around forever. And you know, people have always had 
some form, you know, some, some portion of the word of God throughout all time. And people have always believed it. Now, it is the evidence of things, of the, 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 the substance of things don't work, the evidence of things not seen. And just, you know, say, well, I can't believe that's what you're going to say. You're just going to say that the Bible is the word of God because believe, people believe it's the word of God. And, and what's, you know, you can understand that from the heathen. You can understand that from the, from the non-believing world, why they would mock and scoff at that. But what's, what's disturbing and what's really irritating is when people who claim the name of Christ mock at that. They say, well, I mean, come on. We can't just believe it's the word of God. You're going to tell me you just believe it's the word of God because it says it's the word of God or you just have faith in it just because everybody, other people have or whatever. But think, and, and it's, it's irritating because think of how many other things people just believe by faith from the word of God. Those same people that will, you want to criticize the text and they want to you know, criticize the King James, they, believe, they claim to believe a lot of other things that are taught by the word of God by faith. They believe in creation, don't they? They believe in a literal six-day creation, right? They believe that the earth was created in six days, you know, less than 7,000 years ago. Young earth creationists, so on and so forth. But they'll criticize the fact that some people believe that this is the preserved, inerrant word of God in the English, for English-speaking people. What's harder to believe? <laughs> what requires more faith? There, can anyone in the room tonight prove that God created the earth in six literal days? Nobody can prove that. You can't prove that he didn't either. You can't prove, you know, evolution, you know, unless you believe a bunch of lies, right? But I can't prove to you that any more than I can prove that this is the word of God other than the fact that I believe it by faith. I mean, we believe so many other things by faith. Look at verse 3 in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. How do we believe that the worlds were framed by the word of God? Through faith. So that the things which are seen were not made by the things which do appear. We believe that by faith. Is it really, is it, so we, we can believe that, but it's just such a huge leap to say, well, I believe God inspired and preserved the word of God for English-speaking people in the King James Bible. I believe that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Is that really that big of a leap? It's not. In fact, I think that's easier to believe, you know, if you want to put it in those terms, than creation itself. <clears throat> so we have to, Look, if we're going to say we believe the Word of God is the Word of God and that, and that it's inspired, that it's pure, you know, we're going to have to just believe the things that the Word of God teaches about the Word of God as well. So if we believe the things, if we're, we must believe the things that are taught about the Word of God about the Word of God, if you're following me, okay? If you're going to say, I believe the Word of God is, you know, is, is the Word, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, then you would just simply believe the things that it says about itself. Okay, he says in verse seven of Psalms, if you're still there in Psalms chapter 12, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, you either believe that or you don't. You either believe that God preserved his word from this generation forever or you don't. And it's really as simple as that. Well, how do you why do you believe that the Bible is preserved and is pure and preserved tonight? Because the Bible says it's pure and preserved. And that's all I got for you, you know, and, and believe me, I, I, I believe, you know, we should have, a, you know, a, a more intellectual understanding. We should understand the scholarship behind it, the history of it, and that all really just lends credence to, to what we already believe, that the Bible is preserved. And we can see how God has given it to us through the ages. But at the end of the day, it's still by faith. At the end of the day, it's still you just have to believe that God has preserved his word for us. Go to Psalm 119. I mean, this is just all through Psalms as well. And there's many verses that just talk about the fact that God's word has been preserved. If you're going to believe that the Bible is the word of God tonight, then you're just going to have to believe what the Bible says about itself and trust it by faith. He says, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them forever from this generation forever. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Well, I don't know, Isaiah. We're, 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 you sure about that? I'm, he believed it. He was one of these holy men of old that were moved by that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and that's what he told us about the Word of God. That all these other things are going to, you know, wax old and fade away, but the Word of God is going to stand forever. Jesus said, "Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away." We either believe that or we don't tonight. 
Look at Psalms 119, verse 89. 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Look at verse 140. We're just looking at what the Bible says about itself. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Go to Psalms, uh, go over to verse 152. He said, concerning thy testimonies, in verse 152, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. What are his testimonies? His word. That they've been founded forever. Verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every, uh, and every one of... Uh, look, God's word is settled in heaven forever. You know, we, we believe the word of God to be the word of God because of what the word of God says about the word of God. <laughs> okay? I know it's a mouthful. I know it's, maybe it's a little bit harder to follow along with that. But that's the truth. That's what I believe tonight. I'm not going to pull out, you know, some, do some kind of scientific experiment or something and try to prove to you that the Bible is the Word of God. All, I'm, all I can point to is the Word of God itself. And you either believe it or you don't. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fu fulfilled. I mean, and we think, well, you know, that's just such a, you know, that's just such blind faith. You know, it's circular reasoning. And again, we could expect that from the, from the non-believing world, but it's when Christians themselves start to doubt. It's when Christians themselves start to criticize others who claim to believe other things concerning the Word of God. They'll say, oh, I believe it, what it says about creation. I'll believe what it says about this doctrine or that doctrine. But when it comes to this doctrine of preservation, you know, I don't know about that. <clears throat> but think about this. Think about the fact that, well, you trust the Word of God for your salvation. If you didn't do that, you didn't get saved. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You know, no one, no one got saved just because they looked at the stars or saw a sunset and said, well, there must be a God, and that's it. You know, there was a certain, they had to put their belief in God's promises. They had to put their belief in God's word, what was spoken. And God has spoken unto us, you know, by his son, through the word of God, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Luke 16, it is easier for heaven to, and earth to pass than one tittle uh, of the law to fail. It'd be easier for heaven and earth to just disappear than for God's word, one tittle of God's word to disappear. I mean, that's a promise of word of God, of, of, of the, of that God has given to us. You know, that, that's an assurance that we have. You know, and I'm glad that we have it. There's a lot of, you know, I mean, if we didn't, if we could not trust this book, you know, like, like we preached, uh, you know, just recently, if the foundations be destroyed, what, shall, what can the righteous do? If the foundation of the word of God is removed or it's taken away, you know, we have nothing to stand on. Where else are you going to turn? What else are you going to put your faith in tonight? I mean, you could go pick up some other book. You could go pick up the Quran. You could go pick up, you know, some, some Hindu writings. You could go pick up the Tao Te Ching. You could go pick up any of the, uh, these other books, but they're going to, you know, they're not going to teach you the way of salvation. Those aren't the word of God. They're not inspired. They don't even claim to be inspired. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. What were you born again by? By the word of God. Through the preaching of the gospel. You know, somebody showed you from the Bible that you're a sinner, that Jesus is God, that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again, that you had to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. That's how every one of us got saved. We heard the word of God and we believed it. <clears throat> and that word, the Bible says, is not corruptible. That is, that is the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And how, how do we know it's incorrupt? Because it's the word of God. It's God that has given it to us, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as gra gla uh, glass, grass, excuse me, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof, fall, uh, fall, uh, thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So people say, yeah, I believe the Bible. You know, I got saved. It was God's word that saved me, but I don't really know if this is preserved. I really don't know if this is inerrant. I really don't know if God has preserved his word. I don't really know if it's pure tonight. Then you don't have a corrupt, then you have an incorruptible word. Then you are not born again of, of incorruptible seed. You have a corrupted seed that you're being born by, which is, the, is not biblical. We were born of 
incorruptible seed by the word of God. And really, this is all, again, all in the context of Psalms chapter 12, right? You know, and he's saying, look, there's these bad things going on. It seems like God doesn't even notice, but we have the promises of the word of God. And we, we can trust these promises because we know that the word of God is pure. And we have to accept these promises of God by faith. And you know what? That's harder to do when these, when these things haven't come to pass. It's harder just to accept the promises of God when we haven't seen God arise, when we haven't seen, the, you know, the, 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 when we, we continue to see the oppression of the poor, the sighing of the needy. You know, we might go through seasons of doubt. You know, and that's why we need to be reminded again that the Bible is the word of God, that these promises are true, every single one of them. These things are shortly going to come to pass. You know, we like to say, oh, I believe in, what, that in the return of Christ. You know, it's easy to say that, but it's another thing when evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. And see, it's, it's, you know, it's easier to, you know, we might find ourselves saying, where is the promise of his coming? You know, how long, O Lord, holy and true? You know, does that not avenge our blood? And we, it's, but we have to believe these things by faith. You know, and, we, and the fact that we know that the word of God is pure, that it's incorruptible, that's been preserved, that is an assurance to us that we can trust the promises of the Word of God. Again, if you kept something in uh, Proverbs chapter 30, go back there. See, because, you know, the Bible, he, he ends that psalm by saying, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. It's not, so, so David, obviously, he, he's, he's going through this hard time you know, he's seeing the, these, the proud speaking. You know, they're just, you know, they're speaking with flattering lips. He's seeing the oppression of the poor. He's seeing the sign of the needy. He's saying, man, the vilest, the, the wicked walk on every side. The vilest men are exalted. And then right in all that, we have these verses about how the word of God is pure and how God, he's going to keep them from this generation forever, how God has preserved his word. And, he, and it's a pure word. What's going on here is David is, is relying on the promises of the word of God. And he's reassuring himself saying, no, I know that God is going to arise and cut off flattering lips. I know that God is going to arise for the sighing of the poor and the oppression of the sighing of the need and the oppression of the poor. You know, yeah, it's true. The wicked are walking every side, but we have the promises of the word of God and he's reassuring himself. That's why it says in Psalm 119, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You know, people who are, <clears throat> you know, being tossed to and fro today, people who are being vexed by, by, by the, uh, you know, the, 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 the filthy conversation of the wicked. You know, people, Christians who are, you know, are perplexed and confused and uncertain and, and worried, right, the, by what's going on in the world. You have to ask yourself, how much do you really love God's word then? Because if we really love God's word and we believed it and put our faith in it and, and said, this is pure, this is preserved, you know, that, those type of things wouldn't bother us. That's what it's saying there. He's saying, look, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You know, we see, you know, we see evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. We see the wicked walking on every side. We see the vilest of men being exalted, right, and being lifted up and put in positions of power. And we can, people fret about that and worry about that, but people who love God's word, you know, people that are serving God and they love his law, his word, they have great peace because they know that these things must shortly come to pass. You know, they, they know, hey, this is what the Bible said is going to happen. I, you know, I already knew this was going to happen. This isn't bothering me. And they, can, they have the ability to see beyond all that because they believe this book. They believe the promise that this is pure, that this is preserved. They believe this to be the word of God, complete and perfect. Therefore, they can look beyond to the end and say, well, we know, but Jesus is coming back. Amen. We believe the promises about him coming in, in, a, in glory with his angels. And you know, we're going to be there. We're going to be caught up together, be with him. And, or we're going to come back with him on white horses. And he's going to rule and reign. We believe all that. And... You know, we have great peace. Why? Because we love his law, because we believe it. And I believe that's what David's kind of doing here in this Psalm, chapter 12. He's going through a hard time, and he's reassuring himself concerning the word of God, saying it's pure, it's kept, it's, it's, it's pure, it's preserved, it's mine. You know, I love it. 
And that's what's giving him peace. That's what's giving him hope that things are going to turn out better in the end. <clears throat> he says there, every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. He says every word of God is pure, right? We kind of talked about that. But he says he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. You know, this book, you know, it's a shield. It's, it's a solace to us. That's what I'm trying to say here tonight is that when we believe the word of God by faith, it becomes a solace to God's people. It becomes a place of safety. It becomes a place where we can reassure ourselves that we are the children of God and that we know that in the end, no matter what happens, God is in control and that uh, we're going to come out on top. So again, you know, the evidence of the inspiration and preservation of the Bible is the Bible. And I know, you know, people will mock that and criticize that, but that's the way it is. That's the truth. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll close there. Ephesians chapter 6. How can we say, like the psalmist tonight, that every word of God is pure? How can we say, or well, that's actually a proverb, but how can we say that, you know, his word has been settled in heaven, that he's going to keep it from this generation forever, that his word is very pure? How can we say, how can we echo those same sentiments about the word of God? <clears throat> Because we believe the word of God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the biting asunder of soul and spirit, and is of the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's no other book on earth that can do that. There's no other book that even makes that claim. That says, this book is so sharp it can discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, and anyone who's spent any length of time reading the Bible knows this is true. You know, if you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit and you're reading through God's Word, there's some times where the Bible just cuts us, doesn't it? Where we come to the church and the preacher gets up and he preaches out of the Bible. Maybe it's not even the point of his sermon. Maybe he just quotes a verse and it's like, ah! And the Word of God has a way to just getting right to the heart of the matter and just piercing. And dividing, you know, and showing us the thoughts and tents of our heart for better or worse. You know, maybe it's going to be a reassurance to us, let us know we're doing the right thing, keeping us on the right path, or maybe it's going to be something that convicts us. You know, but that's the power of the Word of God. And that's the, the witness we have of God as God's children that God's Word is powerful. And that's why we can say, well, I believe the Bible because the Bible, you know. And the scholarly world can scoff at that, they can mock at that, and they can look down on that, but that's the truth. It's supernatural. It's a divinely inspired book. And we're saying God's its author. Why wouldn't it be quick? Why wouldn't, you know, quick meaning alive, meaning powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. That's the word of God. The God, word of God isn't just words on a page. There's power behind those words. And when we read it, we feel that. We sense that. We know that to be true. <clears throat> Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. He says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. So we have to have all this whole armor of God, right? And, you know, we have to have the shield of faith. And we have to have the helmet of salvation. But he says the other thing we have to have is this weapon, the sword of the Spirit. And what is the sword of the Spirit? Well, it tells us, which is the Word of God. Again, going back to the fact that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's quick, powerful. It divides asunder and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. And anyone who's gone out, you know, has put this armor on, and picked up this book and gone out and wielded this sword knows that it has power. Amen. Every time we go out and we knock on a door and we and like Paul said, you know, when our gospel comes unto them, not in word only, but in power, look, we know that's an assurance to us. Wow, this really is the word of God. This really is powerful. When people just hear it preached so simply, when we just knock on a door and just say, hey, can I show you how to go to heaven? And we just start to simply go through these simple verses that maybe we've heard over and over and over again or said over and over and over again. But every time, you know, when somebody listens 
and we could see God working on their heart and then they get saved, we walk away saying the word of God has power. How do I know the Bible is the word of God tonight? Because of the fact that it has power to, to change people's minds. I mean, on the spot about what they believe about eternity, God, sin, so on and so forth. I mean, think about how powerful that is to go out and take this book and preach somebody the gospel and watch everything they believe just, just change. Not because I'm so convincing, because I'm such a smooth talker, because I'm not. <laughs> Anyone who's been soloing me knows that. It's because that book has power. Because this book is, is, is the word of God. And that's why we believe it. And then you say, well, how do you know it's the word of God? Because it claims to be the word of God. And we've seen the power that it can wield, not only in, in, in the lives of others, but in our own lives as well. So that should be an assurance to us tonight. You know, as we are living in a, in, a, in a world, you know, the world that lieth in wickedness, as we see the world get worse and worse, you know, the temptation is to doubt. The temptation is to say, is God hiding? The temptation is to wonder if God's ever going to come through, right? But look, if we believe this book is the word of God and we believe it's preserved, we believe it's inspired, then we know that its promises are true and that all we have to do is just be patient and wait on the Lord and trust his promises. Let's go ahead and pray.